Okay, uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome today to today's uh, audit committee. Um, before we start, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you'll notice on uh, page one of, uh, of your papers today uh, uh, that this meeting will be recorded and I think uh, Councillor Donaldson would like to make a comment in that respect. Yes, just because uh, from what I understand, the Strategic Policy and Resources Committee uh, last Wednesday, there isn't in fact an audio or video recording of that. And I really do hope that any problems that we had there, we can sort out, because it does seem to me that the one committee above all, the Audit Committee, actually should have a video and audio uh, audit trail. So I just hope the problems are resolved. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I've been given a reasonable degree of assurance that things should be okay today, um, but we, we are aware of efforts being made behind the scenes to, to rectify the, the problems that we have in that regard, And uh, uh, but I'm very hopeful that today's proceedings will be recorded. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, can I ask if there are any apologies? Uh, I, as I understand it, Councillor McDade is not with us today, and uh, do we have any substitutions? Thank you, Councillor McCall. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Um, are there any declarations of interest in respect of today's business? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Okay, item three on the agenda is the um, minute of the meeting of the Audit Committee of the 26th of June. Um, can I ask if uh, anyone has any issues with the content thereof? Uh, can I take it that we can approve these minutes? Thank you. Can we, can um, we ask for some updates? Yes. yes. Um, so, um, so we're happy that the, the content of the minute is uh, as it should be. Uh, can I ask if there are any matters arising from that minute? Councillor Wilson. Thanks, convener. Good morning. Um, on page five of the, the stuff we have, the third paragraph down about the um, climate change briefing, and that was held, and I just want to thank the officers who put that together. It was an excellent presentation. It was long, it was very thorough, um, but it gave us a lot of food for thought. So, um, Fraser's somewhere, somewhere there, and um, your name was next to this, so thank you, thank you for that, and, and all of those who participated. Um, I, I have another um, question, a couple of things to ask, if I may, convener. Um, By all means. And Councillor Donaldson may want to comment. I'm at the top of page six now. I wonder if we've had any further, um, if, if the courts and tribunal service have recanted on their uh, obstructive nature about not having hearings in Perth. I think um, you were, David Illingworth was, was involved in that as well. Maybe we'll get an update on that. Um, and, um, I think the only third thing is on the same page, internal audit follow-up, um, that the resource link, in my view, would reflect the current operational structure from the 30th of June 2019. Um, and I'm just wondering if we've, if we've got there yet. Thank you. Okay, perhaps if we can uh, um, go for the second question first. And uh, S Scott, your, your name is attached to that. Can you give an update? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, so the Ewan Sturgeon, who's the payroll manager, hasn't confirmed that he has the information from the services to ensure that action is complete. Okay, thank and uh, thank you for that. Uh, and in relation to the other matter, do either Councillor Illingworth or Councillor Donaldson wish to comment further? Uh, first of all, I think I circulated the response I received from the Scottish officer. Uh, and as you know, it was negative. Uh, it is a matter we want to pursue. I took the view, I wanted to wait today to hear what both Lynn Brady and Nicola have got to say, and then we'll, we'll follow up on that. It seems sensible, because uh, I think some of their comments might be quite helpful, but I think it's an issue we don't give up on. Um, okay, yeah, I've been you. chasing with Luke Graham MP, uh, who is still looking into the matter. Um, one of his assistants just left post, so. I chased it up this week and it'll be further 
doing a little bit more chasing with the Ministry of Justice who look after the courts and tribunal service. Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, um, sorry, Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, just on matters arising, can I ask two things? Uh, at the last meeting, uh, Councillor McDade asked about the progress on the Tay Cities deal audit, but it was stated that the detail had not yet been agreed. Has there been any progress on that? That's on page seven. Asked about progress of the, the Tay Cities deal audit and, and yourself advised that a collaborative approach has been taken and you're in negotiation with other local authorities involved, but the detail had not yet been agreed. Is there any? Uh, yes, there is an update. I'm actually meeting with colleagues uh, on the 30th of September. So I hope to get, uh, get a, a greater understanding of what, what the joint work and what separate work will be done after that. Okay, so, so it's, it's it all in progress. The other question I'd like to ask, um, it's on page nine. Uh, it's not about pensions, it might surprise you, but it's actually about, and we've got the Common Good meeting, uh, fund meetings uh, next week just before full council with the Community Empowerment Act. Um, additional resources were being applied to, to establish the list of, of, of properties what progress are we making on that? Uh -huh. Alicia, can you update that? Thank you. Yeah, we had some additional resourcing over the summer and we've made some quite good progress in pulling together the register. Um, there are some quite tricky and complex title uh, matters that are going to be looked at, but we've now secured some additional part-time resource to have a look at that. So um, we're actually managing to make quite good progress with that. and don't think we'll be able to do it within the calendar year, but hoping that we might be able to, to finish it off within the um, financial year. The Under the year. legislation of Community Empowerment Scotland Act, does that set a mandatory deadline or? No, there's an obligation to do it, but I think most councils are in the same position as us in yeah. terms of it's a very resource intensive task. Um, but we've actually managed to dedicate some resource to it and we've made a, a really good start and are making really good progress on that. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you for that. If there are no further matters arising from the minutes, uh, we can uh, move on to item four on the agenda. Uh, as previously mentioned by Councillor Donaldson, uh, we are now uh, looking, very much looking forward to a uh, presentation by Lynn and Nicola. Uh, in relation to welfare rights emerging issues, this follows on from a uh, a previous discussion earlier in the year where uh, a number of issues came to light and we uh, very much looking forward to this update uh, and hoping that the technology works for us. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I think probably most people in the room um, already know me. However, I'm Lynn Brady. I'm the Revenues, Benefits and Welfare Rights Service Manager. And this is my colleague, Nicola Sutherland. She's the Lead Officer for Welfare Rights and also Scottish Welfare Fund. This is a short presentation for you today. Um, can I ask, if possible, can you keep any questions to the end, if that's OK? It's quite a complex area. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more questions coming out as we go, and we're happy to answer anything at the end. And thankfully, I've got Nick along to deal with the complex stuff. She deals with it on a, a technical basis and on a daily basis too. So in May this year, we attended the audit, audit committee following a successful audit in relation to the ongoing welfare reforms and how it's been handled in Perth and Kinross Council. And we agreed to come back to this committee to highlight the main emerging issues for our teams and also those emerging issues that the customers were facing. Welfare benefits, the changes to it and the impact to both customers and the council, it is a complex area, as I've already said, and it can be difficult to articulate. It can be very technical as well. In fact, when we started doing this presentation, it was a technical document. We thought, right, we'll have, we'll have to start again. So what we've done is I'm, I'm going to just give you the high level 
information about what the change is and then what the impact is, the emerging issue from that and any complexities we'll hopefully deal with later should it be necessary. Okay, I think it's also important to, at this stage to give you reassurance as well that although it's in a complex area, there's lots of difficulties, lots of um, media attention on it, there's lots of work getting done to help mitigate and minimise for everybody involved. Okay, so the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you just a list of some of the changes that are probably at the heart of a lot of the new emerging issues. So firstly, we've got the two child limit affecting families with third or subsequent children born or after the 6th of May 2017. In a nutshell, less income. Lower benefit cap, mostly affecting families with three children or more. Deductions from universal credit for historic benefit overpayments could be up to 40% of their UC standard allowance or a universal credit standard allowance. And we're seeing deductions, however, of more than 40%. Basically, again, it leads to less income and the knock-on effect for customers and organisations as a result of having less disposable income. Childcare costs, it can often be a barrier to work as it's paid retrospectively, even though there's other things in place like the flexible support fund, it's available to people um, who are in receipt of certain benefits and who are actively looking for work, perhaps to pay with travel and close for interviews, etc. The withdrawn of universal credit claims, it's not recommended even for those universal claims that have been made in error due to potential loss of income. This is probably one of the most challenging areas for our advice workers at this moment in time. Um, there, there's a risk of giving wrong advice at times because there's so many different permutations of what can happen in so many different circumstances for people. Okay, full service universal credit, well it rolled out throughout the Perth and Canoss area from the 13th of June 2018, however the numbers are still fairly low and remember that rollout was for new people going on to universal credit and perhaps who, those who were on legacy benefits for a small number of people who had a change in circumstances, there's still many people at this time on legacy benefits such as housing benefit that haven't moved over to universal credit as yet. Um, there's a pilot happening elsewhere in England, I think it's in Harrogate, um, piloting the full rollout and we're, we're waiting on confirmation in relation to that. So households with severe disability premium entitlement can't migrate until the 16th of June 2019. That's, that's a particularly complex area as well and well, there may be questions about that. I'm looking at Nicola because I'll need her advice on that. Families with three children or more no longer exempt from universal credit from the 1st of February 2019. EEA nationals, the right to reside and habitual residence test benefit entitlement reassessed under universal credit. This is always a complex area, not just now, historically it's been a complex area. And from the 15th of May, mixed age couples must claim universal credit. Again, bringing quite a lot of difficulties, um, complex advice and situations and outcomes for families. Okay, in terms of the emerging issues, we started off with lots of lots of things but what we wanted to, to hone down on is, is, is the main ones that we're feeling right now particularly in the revenues and benefits area and we deal with every household throughout the whole of Perth and Canoss and for us it's the increase in demand and spend in terms of the crisis grants mainly, mainly due to two sets of circumstances. Just a wee reminder crisis grants and community care grants come under the Scottish Welfare Fund which Nicholas Teams administer and we're finding a significant increase particularly in relation to crisis grants. Um, uh, probably at this stage, uh, many of the cases, it's beyond just not being able to pay their bills. Um, it could be quite difficult situations that people are facing on a daily basis. So this, the two sets of circumstances, okay, natural migration to universal credit and awaiting the first payment. So although there's been work done in terms of the universal credit advance payments, there's still issues around that and people are finding due to time delays and other matters impacting on that, they're having to come for crisis grants and or other support. Also, those receiving deductions from their ongoing universal credit payment for benefit overpayments, again, I mentioned before, the deductions could be up to a certain percentage. That means there's less income when they get their actual universal credit payment. And as you know, for anybody, if you have less income, you have to then look at what do I pay, what can I pay, what do I do now until my next payment, what are my opportunities, and do I have another change of circumstances that's going to affect my next payment of universal credit. 
Also in the revenues and benefit alongside Scottish Welfare Fund, we administer the discretionary house and payment budget. And again, there's additional demand and spend on that. That's been happening over the last several years, but I would say there's more pressure on it in recent months as well. Um, there's local housing allowance restrictions, the benefit cut, which I've already mentioned, and again, the general reduction in income and housing costs due to the cumulative effect of welfare reform since 2010. Basically, less income bring in, for whatever reason, bring in additional challenges. The incomes, sorry, the impacts, I keep saying it, less disposable income for households, no matter what the reason is, that is at the crux of, of most of the issues. It brings additional challenges for the customer, for that household, for that child, and then onto the organisations, the councils, and onto the third sector and other stakeholders as well, and perhaps private landlords, you know, the, a wide range of stakeholders are impacted by that. There's a high risk of debt situations for their household. You know, it, there's no doubt about that. We know that not just universal credit itself, which is only, you know, affecting a small group of people, but the reforms before that and what, what may come with the further rollout um, to all areas for everybody um, in terms of migration, it, it's got to have an impact on on people's ability to pay. It's only small scale at the moment. So colleagues of mine in terms of collecting council tax, my colleagues who collect rent, for example, are keeping a close eye on this. We're monitoring what's happening. We're analysing the situation at this stage, uh, just to learn a little bit more about it in terms of learning so as we could find out what else we can do to help mitigate, minimise the, the impact. Is there a further advice that we can give through welfare rights, for example, and other work we can maybe do with partners? It would obviously be remiss of me if I didn't mention the high risk of child poverty. Again, well documented throughout the UK. Um, some households are at, are at more risk than others. Um, and of course, there's a statutory duty for councils and the NHS for reducing child poverty. And it focuses on six of the priority families, which I've, which I've detailed up there. It all brings more demand and pressure on services, not just my service, most services, if not all services, in lots of different ways. And I see lots of accountants in the room, and I'm sure it brings a different kind of pressure as well for you guys, um, especially when I come to see you. So there's more to pressure on budgets again, particularly welfare funding the crisis grants and the DHP. The challenges, lots of challenges, but we try to just put it down into a couple that we could focus on. It's the complexity of advice administration and the costs associated with all of that as well as the risk of giving somebody wrong advice, because we're all still learning, including those who are administering universal credit, for example. People, it's just the nature of something new as well. It's, it's very, very complex. The, the benefit system is complex anyway. The fill and strategy duties, including the new duty um, since April 2018 of reducing child poverty levels. And just to be reminder of the three, the three headings and areas that we're working in relation to for child poverty, it's about cost of living, it's about employability, it's about social security benefits and benefits in kind, which is the, the last area is the, the area that Nicola and I are leading on, along with our, our colleagues elsewhere in the council and the NHS. And of course, the fairer future priorities, which have now been I get categorised into three areas as well. Again, child poverty, fair work, and socio-economic socio challenge. Okay, so what we're continuing to do to mitigate the impacts or minimise the impacts, we can't mitigate everything. Um, but again, sharing knowledge with information of partners, making sure that everybody has got the information that they need online, it's up to date. They've got somebody in the rights team or maybe other partner orga organisations to help with the more complex work and the appeals representation and to help communicate things in the easiest possible way to those who need our information. So the Joint Welfare Reform Steering Group and work in partnership and upskilling the front line everywhere in the council and with other stakeholders is key. That is what's helped us and our customers so far. We're going to continue to do that. And a wee reminder, we've got free online 24-7 access to services, sort of the welfare rights service for information. So people could be referred, there's signpost information there, or just easy, fairly easy to understand information that hopefully helps them get themselves through the minefield. Early intervention and prevent preventative approach in the revenues and benefits and other services, of course, ensuring that all customers receive the advice they need when they need it. We're doing our very best to get it right at first point of contact. That's important because delays for people could have 
very negative impacts. They miss a deadline for certain things. Um, they get passed on to the wrong person who perhaps, without meaning to, may not give the information they need, may not refer, etc. And they, get, they could be missing out on valuable help and support. Channel shift's important as well. Again, this is about the processes and making best use of our resources. But if we could channel shift to those who can self-serve themselves, um, can do a number of things online without missing out, it means that we've got a little bit more time to spend with those who really need our help and we could deal with the complex matters for them and help them through the, the, the processes, um, help link them up with other partners, for example. Redesign of concessions and delivery. Well, in terms of the work we're doing for child poverty and our ongoing, ongoing work we're doing anyway, we're currently looking at free school meals and school clothing grants and working together with our colleagues elsewhere in the council to find out how we can use the data that we have in the best possible way to maximise the uptake for that and make it easier for everybody, the families and their children. Um, and of course, we'll, we'll look at a, a number of areas in relation to that and feedback, should MD want us to do that. There's an enhanced welfare rights service for family with low, families with low incomes. It's a Tayside Regional Improvement Collaborative funding and internal funding for that as well. There's quite a lot of good work goes on in relation to that. We're working in partnership, partnership with communities of interest, Nicholas team in particular, and every week there seems to be you know, more partnerships uh, coming in, into play and it's really good. It ensures seamless referrals and accesses to advice services. Again, getting it right at first point of contact. No matter where people go, we want them to know what to contact us about and don't just say, oh, you know, get in touch with welfare rights. We want a seamless referral process because that works best. When people are having difficulties, they perhaps don't want to answer the phone, they don't want to have to do it themselves. So we want to stick with them and keep contacting them to help resolve issues. If we don't do it, it's not best value, it's a wasted resource and a definitely a missed opportunity for everybody. Delivering health, sorry, delivering services from health settings, currently at Perth Royal Infirmary, Murray Royal Hospital and GP practices. And we have a number of meetings um, to be held in the very near future to find out what else can be done in relation to that resources permitting, of course. Affordable credit. It's important to give people choices. Um, we have the credit union in, in Perth and Canoes, but what we're also doing at this moment in time is we're partaking in uh, some research with the Carnegie UK Trust about affordable credit, and Nicola's going to meet, and I think it's early next month, to find out what else can be done, and there's some other local authorities involved in these early discussions as well. More, again, feedback to relevant people in relation to the findings of that. We're working very closely with COSLA on an ongoing basis to highlight the level of funding Scottish Government provides for Scottish Welfare Fund. I've mentioned early on that you know that there's a lot of demand, the budget's under a fair bit of pressure, so we're making sure that all the right people are aware of the situation and we're communicating so that we could help find solutions together. And consultations, um, we're ensuring that our voices and our customer voices are heard in all relevant con conversations, um, whether it's relating to welfare reform, child poverty, new initiatives around the benefit system, the work that the Scottish Government's currently doing in relation to the benefits that have been devolved to them, we're involved in all of that. So, outcomes for the customers and the organisation, well, quite a lot of that you're thinking there's doom and gloom, you know, even I'm saying we're doing things. There's a lot of good things have come out of that and there is a positive as well. There's always the good news and there's always there's always opportunities. The welfare rights team are accredited to the highest level for their national standards for information and advice providers. Um, they assisted over 5,000 households with benefit-related issues in the last financial year. The appeal success is 75%. Now, if that was 75% for my collection rates, I'd be thinking, whoa, but 75% for advice is really good. I think the average is around about 64%. That means they're overturning, the welfare rights team are overturning 75% of DWP decisions. Six million pounds of additional income has been put into the pockets of people in our communities through these seamless referrals that I've mentioned to our welfare rights team. And of course, I'm always saying it's difficult to collect, but just to be reminded that we are still collecting council tax, we're negotiating arrangements with people that are struggling to pay, mutually acceptable arrangements, and we're, we're focusing on everything that matters. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Does MD have any questions? <laughs> yeah, if, if I can just come in there. First of all, thank you very much for your, um, for your presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, very sobering information in there, and uh, um, I think uh, on behalf of everybody here, I express our gratitude to yourself and your team uh, for, uh, for the uh, efforts that you continue to do on a daily basis to tackle, uh, to tackle uh, these complex uh, and extremely challenging issues. Um, I, I guess I had, uh, if I can just start by um, asking you just a, a general impression yourself uh, with all that you have described here, uh, whether you feel that uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel, whether, whether you feel that the situation is uh, on an improving curve or whether it is getting harder day by day. Okay. My own personal opinion th uh, and through what I'm experiencing, um, two sides to that. What feels good is I feel that more people in the organisation and other stakeholders are working together to make a difference, especially around areas such as child poverty, and I'm delighted with that. There's, that that's imperative. Do I think it is becoming more difficult? There's no doubt about that. It's more difficult to collect. It's, it's more difficult to give people advice, advice that helps them, because sometimes there isn't any options. We always want to say, here's the information, here's the advice, but sometimes you've got to say no, but it's really hard to find the but sometimes for people. Does that make sense? I think what we've got to also remember as well, there's evidence that, that it's becoming more challenging, and I'm going to refer back to the Scottish Welfare Fund again, more people are coming to us for crisis grants, and Nicola will keep me right, but I think approximately, over the last wee while, approximately 50 applications more for crisis grants a month. Now, 50 might not seem a lot to people, um, but yeah, it, it is. It's another 50 families, 50 households that are struggling. Um, people in work, people out of work. And again, if any of these impacts are as a result of universal credit, I think just to remember that it's only a small amount of people that are on universal credit at this time. There's a pilot going on elsewhere in Harrogate um, because there's lots of people still getting legacy benefits. House and benefit, for example. We've still got lots of people on house and benefit that haven't migrated over yet. I would have liked to be more positive, but that was honest. Honesty is good. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Donaldson. First of all, thank you for an excellent presentation. I, I assume the slides are going to be circulated Absolutely, yeah, yep. later on, yep. and it's all in the public domain. Uh, I think what comes over is just the sheer complexity, and the ground's almost shifting under your feet mm -hmm. on a constant basis. I've got, in fact, three questions, but all mm -hmm. linked in. First of all, in terms of the team that you have, that Nicola has, mm -hmm. in terms of how many do you have in terms of staff resource? I, I don't want to get into operational, okay. but it just to, yeah. Okay. Nicola will give the details, but in terms of the welfare rights, uh -huh. uh, uh, which gives advice, it's a very small team in comparison to many others, but I could pass over to Nicola for <coughs> the actual details. Okay. Ten. 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 Not, all, not all permanent members of staff. Some of these are from external it's funding. External funding. Yeah. So that it's not 10 full-time equivalent, no, no, it's, no. it's right, it's perhaps... Some are temporary, for temporary funding. More yes. Perhaps more six, seven full-time equivalent, yeah. I think yeah. it's eight full-time equivalent. Yeah, right, okay, just to... Right, I want to go back to the... And I did want to deliberately wait until mm -hmm. today to, to hear. Uh, I'm very impressed by, you know, your appeals success rate at, what, 75% against national average of 64 with, um, and I, I really want to be able to follow this up with substantive stuff, quite a bit of your time on a, your appeals is going to appeal hearings in Dundee, mm -hmm. a less extent Stirling, and in uh, uh, Kirkcaldy. Can I ask just what proportion, roughly, do you think that takes up? Obviously, if appeals were in Perth, it would be, you know, it's still going to take up time. What additional time does that kind of travel, would you think, take up? That's really difficult to answer. Um, 
we try um, to maximise the time by having yeah. one representative go in, either for a full day or for, or for half days. But in terms of travelling time, y you're probably an extra hour and a half to two hours every time you're going. Yeah. And what's your other point? But I would also Are assume... We it, it also adds, I would have thought, considerably to the to the stress involved. It's not the best use of resource. No, it no, can be better spent I doing other yeah. work rather than travelling. <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite difficult um, uh, for the girls to uh, come up with a, a specific figure that we, we can hang our hat on. But I think we we, we get the point that it, it it is time and it is therefore money as well. Just could I just. I, I wasn't looking for a precise figure at all. Uh, I don't think you can do that. It's just to get a broad feel. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to ask is you mentioned the credit union and also uh, you mentioned the Carnegie Trust. To what extent do you tie in with Citizens Advice Bureau, uh, the Money Advice Service? Uh, to what degree do you cross-refer um, and, uh, you know, They'll refer some cases to you, you to them. Yeah, um, we have a seamless referral agreement with Citizens Advice Bureau. So they specialise in money advice <coughs> and we specialise in um, welfare benefits. So if they, they would help with completing benefit forms or giving basic benefits advice. But where someone approaches them, if they've been refused benefit or if they think they have the wrong benefit decision, they would then seamless, seamlessly refer to us and we take it forward and challenge that decision. If someone approaches us and they have <coughs> a commercial debt situation or consumer debt situation, they, and they require specialist money advice, we would refer to CEB. So we complement each other in that way. So there's, there's very little overlap or duplication. It's quite clear that they're money advice specialists and we're benefit specialists. Thanks. So Does there's a good, yeah. There's a good working harmonious yeah, relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Okay, uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Convener. My, my, my brief comment on your um, question: Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? I would aver there isn't even a tunnel. I think what we face is a mountain, and your staff are like Sherpas, helping <laughs> folk over or through or around that mountain of bureaucracy and injustice said that piece to get it off my chest. Um, uh, questions. Um, there was an article recently in the paper that the food bank were running out of money. Now I know, happen to know um, a wee bit about the food bank and about their organisation and I know their appeal has been responded to generously by local churches and others but uh, do you have any link with, with, with the food bank is my first question. Absolutely we do. Do you want to speak about the link then? Mm -hmm. We have um, the link with the Perth Food Bank is basically us um, referring people there where we're either not able to help them at all in terms of crisis grants or we're helping tide them over until we're in a position where we can help them. Because maybe they've, they've come for assistance <coughs> too late in the day or whatever, we'd give them a food bank referral and then hope to help them as soon as possible the next again day. But with Broke Not Broken, the food bank in Kinross, we train the volunteers. So <coughs> if anyone from the Kinross area approaches for assistance, in the first instance, they will make an application for a crisis grant before just kind of giving food out, if that makes sense. So they try um, to give people exactly what they're, they're needing at that time. Um, and we train them on an ongoing basis. We also train, give them training about universal credit and we keep going back. And we've got a really good relationship with them to try and make sure that people have got what they need in their pockets, as well as maybe getting food parcels. That, that's great, thank you. Mention, convener, has been made of the credit union and I was recently um, invited along to the, their office, and which is very close to the council now, and very close to the CAB yep. um, a, a, as well, to, to welcome them to the new premises in George Street. But um, you, you have links with them as well. Absolutely, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And is that another part of the, the, the seamless process? So th is, they're, they're is, trying yeah. hard to help people to totally. bank Try some cash. And, and Absolutely, and trying to get sustainable mm. solutions for people as well where it's possible to do so, to help if we can. It's about maximising what we can give them, and it doesn't always happen overnight, but to get all that in place so 
going in the future, they know what they can get, what they can't get, and it helps them make choices. Just, sorry, just to add on to that, the, the um, crisis grant scheme has to be it has to be delivered in a holistic sense. So when somebody comes to us for assistance, it's not transactional, it's not just a case of yes, you'll get or no, you won't. We'll also do a benefit check as long as the person's willing for that to happen. Most people say yes. So if they're missing out on any statutory entitlements, we'll do what we can to make sure that we get them to kind of prevent them from having to come back again in the future. It doesn't always work because people come for all sorts of different reasons. They've maybe ran out of money or they've lost their money. But more often than not, we'll find that they maybe should be applying for a bus pass or a blue badge or they're missing out on a premium and their benefit, that kind of thing. So we do try and get beyond the presenting issue when we can. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, convener, you'll be pleased to know my last point is, is three letters, PIP. PIP. We haven't heard from about that. Um, we've spoken about universal credit. If, PIP, if universal credit's a mountain, PIP is a cliff. Um, there's a danger of falling off it, um, to be honest, in terms of applications. How much demand on your time do folk with PIP applications in that <coughs> threadful 40-page form, which I'm very familiar with, um, how much do you engage in that process? Not very much in terms of for foreign filling, because the, the majority of my team are made up of welfare rights officers, so it's more the complex end of things, so it's where people have been refused PIP. Um, will help with foreign filling if the person's affected by cancer or if it's a low-income family um, with children because we get external funding that would help us to do that. But no, you're right, it is complex, it's a long form and it's, it's difficult for people. Okay. Thank you for that, that reply. I think we should note as a committee convener that many people who are, have required to fill in PIP forms may have health issues may have mental health issues and may not be immediately available have the help and skill and expertise you would need to fill in the form and I talk from personal experience. I, I share that personal experience, Councillor Wilson, so thank you for, um, um, for, for these comments. I have uh, further questions from <coughs> Councillor Williamson, Councillor Illingworth and Councillor McCall and Councillor Jarvis. So we'll take it in that order if we may. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier you've got 75% of your, your, your cases are, are going to, are, you know, being overturned at appeal. That's, that sounds like an awful lot of mismanagement on behalf of the uh, system that's judging that, 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 that people aren't eligible to fund it in the first place. So is it, is it not a conversation to be had with people about why are they judging people wrongly if 75% of these cases are getting to overturned? That's my first question. Any feedback that we've got in relation to policy, legislation around the benefit system, um, we always, always make sure that we feed it back in. If it's time for consultation before the decisions get made um, or afterwards, perhaps via our COSLA reps, through our professional groups, um, MD will listen to us and the Scottish Government. So we would constantly feed in back these issues not just councils and welfare rights um, officers, but also charities as well, such as Joseph Ringtree Foundation, um, Child Poverty Action Group. They will keep feeding back um, to DWP, to government, to MSPs, etc., MPs, about particular issues. For example, in the lead up to universal credit being implemented, there was lots of organisations, including our own, who were saying these are the issues that we think will happen and we were very vocal about them does, does that answer your question yeah yes it does it, it 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 feels almost like the system's designed for people to fail in the first instance in the hope that they'll just go away and hide under a bushel rather than come back and appeal, appeal a decision that's been made um against them and, and it feels like the system's set up wrongly so yeah i, agree. I understand what you're saying about having to go back to central government I think the, the other thing is you mentioned about the full, 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 full rollout of the universal credit. When is that due? And are we going to be receiving any additional fundings to, to implement that? With regards to the, the, the next stage, it was recently called Migrate to UC. I think it's now called Move to UC. Um, the last I heard in terms of, uh, from our DWP colleagues. So the pilot of, of that full process is cut, getting carried out in Harrogate Council just now. I think it's only very recently started from memory. And again, from memory, I think they're talking about taking it forward to 2023. 
21, sorry, sorry, 20, 21. However, um, I'm not sure personally if that is going to be the date that it, it will be rolled out further. I'm not sure. There is no further detail on that from DWP. I think they're looking towards some of their findings. They want, from what they're saying, they want to learn as they go along. Um, so that may be delayed as a result of that. I'm not sure. There we go. Right, there's an increase in demand for your crisis grants. Uh, I imagine that's a, that, that's a fund that you've got, mm -hmm. and, and it, I, I imagine that the, it's a resource that's been tested. Is mm -hmm. um, How big is that crisis fund? And if we are going to be experiencing more, more people coming through the system with the, the rollout, is that something we should be having a look at, of increasing the size of that fund? Is that council or, or where does that fund come from? Okay. I'll get Nicola to answer the, the part about the figures of that, it's okay, but b before she does so, um, what I would say is yeah, it's, the, the, the fund is under significant pressure. And as I say, we're communicating that wild, widely, whether it's with Scottish Executive, COSLA, with our, our colleagues elsewhere in the council, our, our Section 95 officer, and we will be taking some information to EOT in the very near future with with regards to that, to make sure that any risks or issues are being considered. You keep it the numbers and the values, sorry. Um, the Scottish Welfare Fund is a Scottish Government scheme, so we receive £615,000 a year to administer the scheme, but at, at the moment, after um, the first quarter, it looks as if the demand will outstrip the amount of money that we get by about £40,000 for crisis grants alone. And as Lynn's already said, the demand's roughly at the moment about 50 additional applications for crisis a month. And that's the, f the first three months of this financial year. So, so who picks up the additional 40,000? 40, Is that the Scottish uh, Government? No. That's, that, as I say, this is an issue that I'm taking to UT in the very near future to discuss what the options are for the council and um, to discuss it further. In, in past years, um, the pressure, there's been pressure on it, but it's perhaps not been so high, and I've managed to find that within my own budgets. But no, there, uh, at this time, there's no additional funding from Scottish Government. Okay, thank you for that information. And now, uh, Councillor Illingworth, thank you. Great. Um, well, thank you for a fantastic presentation about the complexities of the welfare system. Um, it, and it's clear that you do a fantastic job in making sure that people get, uh, as far as possible, get the benefits they're entitled to under the law. Um, so thank you for that. But it, my question is, is to the convener. I'm just not sure if this is the right forum to, to hear about this. I mean, this is audit committee and we're involved in risks and processes, and I'm just not sure it's relevant to this committee. Perhaps it might be a better uh, Housing and Community Safety Committee. Uh, I, I take on board your comments, Councillor Ellingworth, um, uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, we, we are where we are. We're having this discussion, and I think it's very, very important that, that, um, that we hear the concerns. I, I do think, uh, I, I do share your view that uh, it would be a worthwhile exercise for this presentation also to be given to um, the uh, the Housing and Communities uh, Committee. But what what I would uh, add in that regard, and what I was going to say at the uh, at the end of questions, is um, can we please ensure that uh, that the slides which you've already indicated uh, will be shared with the, uh, with this committee. Uh, um, after today, uh, that they be shared with all elected members, mm -hmm. uh, so that there is uh, there is no doubt that this is you know, that people have this information, uh, yes, and no and we can take this into account uh, in various committees going forward. Um, but you know, we'll continue with this debate just now, uh, and and ask for Councillor McCall's question. Thanks. Thank you, convener. Thank you, convener. And thank you to Linda and Nicola very much. Um, my questions really are around the, um, are there any lessons we can learn from the 75% of challenges 
or appeals that are upheld that we can perhaps apply going forward? That's my first question. Do you want them all together? Or do one, one at a time. One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a difficult one as it is. Just uh, uh, Nicola deals more closely with appeals. What I would say is a general, a general response to that is, and everything we do in the Revenues and Benefits Service, we do have a look at a les lessons learned approach um, in terms of making sure we're using the best use of our resources, our information, the, the help that we give people. Um, so there's, there is that culture of a lessons learned environment anyway. And I know it's very general, but if you get into to add. It's different, it depends on the appeal. It can be um, failure to attend a medical assessment, so the benefits refused. It could be that the wrong evidence has been used, that the person's not understood the form. There's loads of different reasons why um, appeals can be overturned and it's not always a sort of systemic failure thing, it's something else. But we do, we, we learn as we go along and we, we provide training to third sector, to CAB, to frontline staff that are supporting people. We'll t take those lessons and pass them on and say, right, this is how you would fill this in in the form and we'll try and educate people so that when they are supporting their customers, they're getting the best service possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I was quite curious to understand you know, what was the um, basis of an appeal, and, and but you've answered and said they're not systemic, they're varied. They can be. They I mean, can there, be. There, there can be. The, the failures can be a variety of reasons, but often it can be it can be something as simple as somebody not attending a medical assessment and us then having to show the reasons why that's happened. Does that okay. make sense? No, no, it makes perfect sense. So like like Councillor Drysdale and Councillor Wilson, I too have experience of some of these types of forms mm -hmm. and they're quite daunting and yep. halfway through you start to doubt yourself. Yep. And so I suppose my question was really driven from, is there something that could be done preemptively if we had enough evidence to say this is a typical type of error or issue that perhaps people don't get to crisis? It's maybe too early to do that yet, but that's, no, that, that's what happened I was thinking in the past, of. Well, like employment and support allowance. The, the form that people were asked to fill in wasn't up front, and it now is. It's so it would ask questions, um, and the, in order to qualify for the benefit, the descriptor was clear. We all knew as advisors what the descriptors were, but they weren't in the claim form. So the person was being asked a question, and it may or may not fit the descriptor. Does that make sense? So, but that's better. That's improved now because um, third sector organisations like Child Poverty Action Group have fed that back to DWP or Social Security Advisory Committee have said, right, that's not right, that needs to be changed. So these things do, these happen all the time. Um, that makes perfect sense uh, in terms of the forms themselves and not being clear what the questions are for. Um, my follow-up to that then, I suppose, is how many of the people who come to your team mm -hmm. um, have not engaged with another partner elsewhere? You're the first point of contact. Okay, that would be hard to, to put a figure on. Um, Probably the majority of the people have a worker or they've had assistance from someone. Um, but the majority of our referrals, strangely enough, are self-referrals. In terms of crisis grants, it can be a variety of reasons, but sometimes and quite often there is just no place else for MD to go or they feel like we could often be the last port of call. So it often feels like that. Okay. Um, one other question, if I may. Yeah, um, I'm just conscious of time, so if we, if we can be as brief as possible. Hopefully this will be quick. Thank quick. you. Um, how, do you have any indication of the ratio of uh, people who come to your service between in-work and out-of-work customers? No, it's not something that we, we capture in the case management system, unfortunately. No. But for what I would say is for crisis grants or the Scottish Welfare Fund, it overwhelmingly would have been people out of work. But welfare rights, you get more of a mixture. Definitely. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jarvis. Thank you, Ms. Arden. Um, could you just elaborate a wee bit more on mixed age and the difficulty you have there? I mean, and you talk about pension age, people in under pension age. The complexity is not. It's not really the complexity, it's the fact that a mixed age couple, their, their income will be almost half now. So where they would have, their income would have doubled if one of the partners was over pension age. Mm -hmm. They now have to live longer with less money. That's as simple well, enough as, like that's quite crude, but that's, mm -hmm. that's the answer. Okay. And that just, th that 
presents challenges then for that household. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, another one, you, I mean, the medical profession is always saying how under pressure they are and time poor. So how can people access help there? What kind of help is available from medical establishments? From health settings. So we have a weekly outreach at PRI at the Cornhill unit mm -hmm. for people affected by cancer. But if anybody was to go in, they, they would get advice. Nobody would be turned away. We we'll also do fortnightly outreach at Murray Royal Hospital. Um, but we have really good links with community mental health teams as well. Mm. Um, we have a monthly outreach at Loch Leven in Kinross. And again, that's predominantly for people, it's, it's advertised as um, for people affected by cancer, but nobody would be turned away. It wouldn't be, do you have cancer or no? Anybody would be able to access that service. We're also doing a pilot with Ard Blair, um, GP practice in Blair Gowrie, and that's once a fortnight, and we're doing that for 12 sessions. Um, but what we did is we did a, a wee talk to the GPs in their 15 minute break and that afternoon just basically saying this is a service this is how we can help and that afternoon one of the GPs that wasn't at the meeting sent us a seamless referral via email so we're like yes that works but then they actually have to be there they can still contact us um, where else we we did do some pilot sessions at nine wells at the advice shop but that didn't prove that sustainable in terms of resources and having to, to travel around and that. But um, we just we work in partnership with our TSEG colleagues, so they'll do the, like the first point of contact advice and then refer on to us if it's a case. I think I'll just stop right. you there because okay. I think that, that, that's very good. Um, but basically, you're supplying the staff to these yes. advice yeah. centres. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can I just ask um, one further question I had myself, which uh, you, you made reference to uh, the um, frequency of uh, overpayments in excess of 40% um, uh, and, and that being a particular concern to you. How, how can that come about? If, if the law is that the maximum is 40%, how, how can it come about that um, it's more than 40 um, the only thing we can we've spoken to CPAG about this so Child Poverty Action Group and it can happen um, because of the regulations around UC advances so the actual benefit overpayment if it's deemed to be fraudulent it can be taken off at 40% if the person's working and it's not fraudulent it should be 25% and if the person's out of work and it's not fraudulent, it should be 15%. What we're seeing most often is 40%. And we don't know if it's fraudulent or not. That's obviously something that we we'll have to um, look into and dig about. But you see advances, the way the legislation's written, it doesn't say anything about the 40% or um, it can just be taken back. However, if we contact debt management, we can ask them to reduce that or... Um, change the, the deductions around, but that means somebody then getting involved, if that makes sense. So the law can't allow it. It's really concerning. Councillor Donaldson, finally. Yes, for, uh, I'm going to ask about child poverty, but can I just quickly say I entirely disagree with Councillor Illingworth. The Audit Committee is not just about controls and processes. It's not just about figures and accounts, although we're going to be coming to them in just a minute. Uh, but it is also about risk, about reputational risk. And I think here it's absolutely vital that with the, often the most vulnerable members of society, of our community, we can deliver services, not just efficiently and effectively, but humanely and compassionately. And uh, indeed, I think you do an excellent job. On, on, on child poverty, uh, I was in touch with you on one aspect but this is broader uh, implications as well. There was a presentation on child poverty to, to councillors some months ago. Uh, as a local ward councillor in Strathairn, I was particularly concerned that Strathairn has the highest area of proportion of child poverty of any area outside of Perth City uh, as a whole. Out, out with Perth, it is the highest area, and it had gone a sharp upward trend from 13 to 17 to 20 percent. That set alarm bells ringing. Now, I know you've put in some special measures 
could you set out what these are with, I think it's with a Tayside Collaborative, and are these going to be sustainable? And can you do the same with the Collaborative if, if problems like this arise in other areas? So, so we receive um, money from the Collaborative and we've put additional resources to that. The money from the Collaborative was for pre-birth and first year, so to target um, pregnant women and families with children under one. The additional resource that we put to that was so that we can basically help anyone, uh, any families with low income. So it, it's not specifically for Strathairn, it's for, for anywhere. But the, the original funding was to target that area, but we basically just said, look, it'll be anybody, anybody coming forward, even if it's out with the resource that we have identified will help. Um, and what I should have said earlier about the health settings, we have seamless referral agreements with midwives, health visitors, family nurse partnership, um, change is a must, and the family focus team, and that's relatively new. I've been working with health visitors, midwives, and the family nurse partnership for a couple of years, but we've taken on board these other teams that are helping extremely vulnerable families with, with babies and young children, um, so that's available throughout Perth and Kinross now. Okay, I'm not. Can I just add something really quickly? In terms of the um, strategy and the work being carried out in terms of child poverty, we're working very closely together with a number of people. But one of the actions that we're doing is going, making a point of going around the local area partnerships to discuss issues in particular areas as well. Not sure if that helps, but it's about you know help everywhere as well as particular focus where it's needed. Okay, just say grateful to both of you. I'm sure all of us here appreciate your contributions today, both, both yourself, Lynn, thank and, you. and Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Donaldson. And can I just um, draw things to a close by, uh, again, thanking you very much for what has been a very thought-provoking discussion. And I'm sure, uh, you know, I speak for um, everyone around the table, um, perhaps apart from Councillor Ellingworth, but I'd like to disassociate myself from his comments as well. Uh, and I would um, thank you for the clarity of, of your comments. Uh, and as I said earlier, please do share these with all elected members so that there is full awareness of the issues that your team is facing. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, um, now moving on. Um, the, this, this committee, the, uh, the uh, other main piece of business, and there's lo lots of other uh, business to come, and I'm conscious of the time. Uh, however, uh, the main piece of business uh, that we have, have to discuss now is uh, the audited accounts, uh, the annual audited accounts of Perth and Kinross Council uh, for 2018-19. And if I can ask Mr. McKenzie uh, to give his uh, report, please. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, councillors. I appreciate that members have already had the opportunity to meet with our external auditors this morning, which I trust you found useful. So I will keep my comments brief, and I'm mindful um, of, of the time available. The committee is requested to note the contents of KPMG's draft annual audit report to the members of Perth and Kinross Council, and the control of audit for the year ended 31st of March 2019 and approve the 2018-19 audited accounts for signing to give a letter of representation. At the time of drafting the report, it was intended to submit the accounts to Council on the 25th of September for no time, but our auditors have requested that this be deferred to allow for closure of the audit files. But the key thing is the committee approving the, audit, uh, sorry, the audited accounts for signing today. The accounts remain largely unchanged from the draft approved by the committee on the 26th of June, bar some minor presentational issues and the adjustments set out in section two of the report, and I'll come to those very briefly. The first of which is in relation to the employee statutory adjustment account, which recognises liabilities in terms of holiday pay. The second, more substantial adjustment is a £5.3 million increase in the Council's estimated net pension liability arising from the judgment by the Supreme Court on the 28th of June in relation to age discrimination, known as the McLeod case. Neither of these adjustments impact upon the Council's financial performance in 2018-19, nor on the level of uncommitted reserves, 
which were approximately £12.7 million, as at the 31st of March 2019. Members will appreciate that the scope of the audit is more than just the accuracy of the financial statements. In the wider scope and best value section of the auditor's report includes commentary on the Council financial management and governance arrangements. As always, I would offer my thanks to colleagues across the Council for their support in the preparation of the annual accounts and to my own team led by Scott Walker and Alison O'Brien. I'd also thank Mr. Mr. Wilkie and the audit team for their challenging but constructive and positive approach to the audit which is based upon a good working relationship, well, at least so far. Um, colleagues and I are happy to take questions, convener. However, I understand that the committee will be keen to hear from Mr. Volkey. Okay, thank you very much for that report. Um, can I ask if there are any questions to officers? Councillor Wilson. Thanks, convener. Um, yes, we did have a, a useful um, time with, with the, the external auditors earlier on. I think a lot of points were, were, were covered then. Um, just two, two points, convener. Um, Mr. McKenzie has referred to one of them, and it's on page five of the, the main report, and item two, two, about the, the adjustments. I, 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 I don't like the, I prefer the word adjustments to um, what, what's um, misstatements, I think. Um, but that's just audit speak, I suppose. Um, one of them was beyond our control, and you've just referred to that. Um, and the other one, I, I gather from our external auditors from discussion this morning, that that was a, a, an, an, an adjustment that they, they required you to put in that's not had any material effect on, on the accounts. Is that correct? Thank you, Councillor Watson. That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, I'm moving on almost to the back now to the action plan and the KPMG um, report to... Um, the councillors, and that's on the KPMG, page 35. The council numbers disappear at some stage in the process. That's something we might try and look at again, Karina. But um, the action plan summarises specific recommendations, and there are two there. Um, I think they're straightforward and I understand them. Um, Mr. McKenzie, that seems a very low number um, to have for um, a, 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 an audit of an organisation of a about £400,000 per, per annum. Uh, do you want to comment on that at all? And there are deadlines for both of them. £400 million. Four hundred million. Sorry. I beg your pardon. I was thank never very good with figures. Four. Thank you, David. £400 million. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, our target is really zero recommendations, to be frank. Um, yep. But um, I, I, would, I would be content with the recommendations which are there. Um, I think that, that reflects the amount of work that my colleagues across the organisation, to prepare on the accounts, and also the constructive dialogue we have before we get to the stage of having the support. I think that's very reassuring, convener, and I'm, I'm pleased. And also, we did cover, and I won't take up more time just now, but we did cover the prior year recommendations, just for noting that they, in fact, have all been implemented. Thank you. If there are no further questions, can I also ask Mr Wilkie? Oh, sorry. Councillor uh, yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, can I just say it's an absolute pleasure to read such a, a fantastic, outstanding report on our financial managers. Um, I see fi our financial management as one of the brightest jewels in the PKC crown, along with child protection and the housing department. So it's a, a real pleasure to see such a glowing report from our external auditors, along, along with the report in the best value audit. So uh, many congratulations. Okay, um, I, I, sorry, Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, on the accounts, I do have two, a couple of questions. Um, uh, one of these came up earlier on it's on the, the question of procurement and contracts and counterparty risk. And it's on page 25. Earlier on... Uh, Sorry, Councillor Donaldson. We're, we're, um, at the moment, we're talking about the uh, accounts themselves. I think um, we'll ask Mr Wilkie... No, this to, is the key. OK, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we'll, we'll ask Mr Wilkie at, at this point, if I may, just before you continue with your question, if, if he has any comments he wishes to make in relation to his um, annual audit report? Um, perhaps just 
um, briefly on our executive summary and audit conclusions, and then, if you wish, we can speak about our significant risks also. So our executive summary, which is page three of our report. Um, this report is the conclusion of our work, um, and within the body, we conclude positively in respect of each of the significant risks which are shown top left, the first two being presumed by audit standards about uh, override of controls and fraud risk in respect of income recognition. In respect of property, plant and equipment revaluation, there's an element of estimation uh, undertaken by officers. And uh, what I would reference is that management have taken on board recommendations we made in the previous year about using external valuers to supplement the work of the internal valuer, particularly in respect of more complex valuation judgments. We nonetheless continue to challenge those valuations and we are satisfied with them in the accounts this year. We have made one low-graded recommendation about continued enhancement of the valuation documentation. In respect of retirement benefits, we've updated our description of the risk within this report, um, recognising two specific aspects, um, guaranteed minimum pensions and the McLeod judgment, the latter uh, leading to an adjustment within the financial statements, which we have not recorded as a misstatement on the basis that the information wasn't available to management when you prepared the draft financial statements. There is an element of judgment within the number uh, which has been included within the financial statements, which we can talk about in more detail, if you like. Um, we've commented on the closure of recommendations in respect of the prior year, make two low-graded recommendations. Um, and on for page five, the main point to take from that is our intention to issue an unqualified opinion in respect of the Council's group financial statements, as well as the Charities and Common Good Fund. Um, there's probably nothing else specifically I would reference. If you would like us to speak to the significant risks, we could do so also, or otherwise take questions. Uh, I'm happy if you want to continue on significant risks just now. Just any further comments you wish to make. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Um, so we identified four significant risks, and these were communicated to the audit committee in our audit strategy. So we have not identified any new ones since then. And first two are pretty standard, and we identify them for all our clients. I won't spend much time on it. On them, uh, first one is the management override of controls fraud risk. The second one is the fraud risk uh, from income recognition and expenditure recognition. Uh, we performed our testing and uh, with satisfactory results. So if there is no questions to those two standard risks, we can continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, can we perhaps revert back to Councillor Donaldson um, to continue with your question? Thanks. It, that's it. Apologies. Uh, regrets for uh, jumping the gun there. Uh, uh, just quickly on the McLeod judgment, yes. and I, I don't quite entirely understand it, but uh, it, it is quite complex. Is that basically a one-off? Uh, no, it's not because. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so I think this year, uh, what kind of clarified was once the um, uh, court made their decision in. Let me check December, if I remember right. Uh, there was guidance issued by uh, Scottish government, sorry, by the UK government, in terms of how to implement this judgment. However. We're still expecting that there will be further uh, guidance, and uh, from I think from meetings and from uh, the, the, the the guidance we we got, we kind of there was an indication that the impact could double in in next year of the McLeod. I think. Yeah. Sure, I'll maybe just add then, um, it's, it's in respect of our page twelve, the. Council have included an additional liability of £5.3 million. Mm. That relates to active members pre-2012. There remains some judgment over whether there is an additional liability in respect of members, active members post-2012. We don't consider that element to be material for the financial statements, um, but it, it could be, um, and, and it could lead to an additional liability in the future. Because double 5.3 million, certainly that would be material, yes. It's, it's a bit er too early maybe to conclude on that, but that's just early estimates, and because it's area of judgment, that, that there will be a lot of work done by actuaries. 
that answers. The question I was trying to ask earlier was on procurement. It was I raised earlier on this morning, and it's on procurement. It's on your own the KPMG report. If you could just comment, or maybe council officers could. Page 25, the council do not consider the financial sustainability of suppliers on a regular basis after contracts are awarded, which raises a risk that suppliers may not be able to continue providing services. Now, the point, uh, there is clearly a procurement strategy in place, but the point here immediately comes to mind is the likes of Carillion, what happened there with many councils, uh, Interserve, inter um, and there have been one or two other contractors where there have been financial problems. Could you comment on that? Um, in, in respect of this aspect of the report, we are following up on um, a recommendation from Audit Scotland and their guidance to auditors to inquire, and therefore our conclusions are based on inquiry alone and not testing, but our understanding is that the Council will more often consider financial sustainability of suppliers based on the staff's view when they are interacting with those suppliers if something comes to light rather than on a systemic or overarching basis for suppliers as a whole. I would agree there is therefore an element of risk. So you feel that basically the council needs to take further action, further steps in this regard? I'm sure officers may want to comment. We hadn't concluded our inquiries at the time of producing this draft, which is why we say it's outstanding confirmation from procurement, but um, pending that confirmation, then I think there may be a recommendation to be made. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any further questions? Councillor McCall. Thank you, Convener. Uh, my question is, um, again, on page 25, uh, it's on the question of additional future funding, such as the Tay Cities deal and the UK shared Prosperity Fund are expected to be available in the short term. The UK Shared Prosperity Fund um, is a little opaque at the moment. Do we have any indication of A, how much we are expecting to receive from that and what the likelihood is that it will be delivered in the short term? Mr Mackenzie. Thank you, Kavina. Thank you, Councillor McCall. Very brief answer to that is no, no indication at the moment. Thank you. Do you have anything to add, sir? Uh, no, no. Uh, I was just wondering, shall I continue going through the significant risks? Is By all means, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I can start with the um, pensions one because we've already had some discussion on it. So pensions uh, risk on page 11, uh, basically the risk is around estimation and number of assumptions used by the actuaries, which we challenged during the audit with the use of our internal specialists and uh, this year this has been uh, complicated by the two uh, events which is the uh, guaranteed mention uh, sorry guaranteed minimum pension uh, case and the McLeod case uh, our conclusion was that uh, the assumptions used by the uh, actuaries were balanced uh, in terms of the GMP and uh, McLeod. Yeah, we concluded that uh, there has been no uh, impact or no no requirement to to reflect the impact of GMP equalization in the accounts. Uh, in terms of the impact of McLeod that has al already been discussed, so uh, the, the pension liability increased by 5.3 million as a, uh, as a result of this work. Overall, as I said, we concluded that the assumptions were balanced and uh, we are satisfied with the disclosures in the accounts. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if there are any further questions, uh, if, if not, no, no further questions. Okay. Um, can the committee agree to note the contents of the KPMG draft annual audit report to the members of Perth and Kinross Council and the controller of audit for the year ended 31st March 2019? Is that agreed? Thank you. And further, can the committee 
agree to approve the 2018-19 audited annual accounts and authorise the leader of the council, the chief executive and the head of finance to sign them and also authorise the head of finance to sign the letter of representation. Is that agreed? Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, and can I just conclude again by thanking uh, officers for their usual diligent uh, efforts in, in getting to this stage. Uh, thanks as always and thanks to the external auditors too for their scrutiny and for their um, involvement in the process. Uh, okay, so uh, moving on, conscious of time and conscious that um, uh, colleagues have arrived for the uh, next meeting, but we do have uh, um, three further items of uh, business on the agenda to discuss. Um, the first is the internal audit follow-up, and Jackie can ask you to make some brief comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, I, I will be brief. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention at paragraph 1.2. Um, that uh, 11 actions had a completion date of May and June 2019, uh, eight of which have been completed. The three actions which have yet to be uh, completed are included within the appendix. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions about those, uh, those actions. And are there any questions? No. Can we agree to note the report? Quickly. Oh, sorry, Councillor Donaldson. But very quickly, uh, it is put down as low risk and it's on a festival strategy and reporting and it's been accepted. It's just the time scale that's been involved here because this has been ongoing since uh, 15th of March 2017. Uh, so we're now talking two and a half years and we still don't have a definitive strategy. Uh, is there any real reason for this? Uh, uh, there's, there's been obviously a number of uh, updates to this committee uh, following each of the, 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 um, the agreed dates. What did impact on uh, the, the, the final few hurdles really was uh, 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 the head of service returned to take over this responsibility uh, and was looking at the, um, the work that had been done and decided on a, a whole scale, di a different approach to the strategy. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, Fraser uh, Crofts would be able to, um, uh, to, to uh, concur with that. But it resulted in a, com a complete rewrite of the strategy, which is now coming forward to uh, SMT, um, hopefully this, later this month, with a view to going to uh, the Environment and, um, and Infrastructure Committee. Yeah, I think it, we certainly need it. Just to give one example, and I may have been a bit local here, but you know, every year we do seem to have the Creef Highland Games on exactly the same Sunday as Perth Salutes. And it's on major events, not on small ones, but on major events, we try to avoid clashes of dates. I think that's quite important. And we'll be here. Okay, if there are no further questions, can we agree to note that report? Thank you. Uh, moving on, and I've just lost my sheet. Uh, uh, item seven on the agenda is internal audit update. Again, Jackie, can you give a, a report? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, work has continued on the uh, internal audit plan that was approved at this committee. Um, the team are progressing with uh, many of the audits, and you can see from the appendix which audits are, um, and consultancy activities are in progress. Um, we continue to be contacted by uh, services for advice and guidance, which is always welcome, um, and have been um, uh, involved in a number of areas as a result of this, which will um, improve um, internal audits' knowledge of uh, various control environments uh, sort of going forward and can in influence uh, future um, internal audit plans. We are making good progress and uh, would anticipate that uh, the plan will be completed within the year at present. But I'm happy to take any comments on this. Thank, thank you, Jackie. Just before I open to, to questions, uh, if I can just ask a question of my own, which is in relation to Audit 1908, withdrawal from the European Union, given the high profile nature of the <laughs> subject matter, shall we say. Um, uh, and noting that the, uh, uh, your audit is in progress, can you give a verbal update at this point? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, part of this of, of the scope for this work is really to be in, to ensure that the council is as prepared as it can be 
uh, for uh, us exiting the European Union. And a lot of work has been undertaken by many areas of the Council, um, particularly thinking uh, as an example of workforce planning, where we're reviewing um, uh, our risks uh, uh, in, in that regard. So there's a lot of work that is, being, uh, is ongoing. We do have key people who are identified um, to, to liaise as appropriate with various different bodies. Um, and the work that they are undertaking is being you know, cascaded up and down to ensure that we are as prepared as we can be. Uh, the date of February 2020 for a potential report back to Audit Committee, um, it, that may well change, uh, but it certainly is the first one after, um, no, after, um, after November, which would be our next Audit Committee meeting, for which papers would be required by, um, by mid-October. Uh, so February is uh, the, the best date at the moment for that report to come to committee. Thank you. Are there any further questions, Councillor Donaldson? Yeah, uh, on the uh, actual timetable, um, I think the withdrawal from the European Union one or not withdrawal, we shall see. I think it will be interesting. I want to ask on 1912, on page 23, on Horsecross, where that's scheduled for a report back on in April 2020. Now, there's going to be the um, that's going to be a major issue for scrutiny to consider uh, at its meeting this afternoon. Now, I'm not going. To, I don't think we want to steal their thunder, but that audit report on Horse Cross will that come after, or can we be assured it will come before the council takes a final decision on the potential merger of Horse Cross? And culture PK. With regard to this, um, the work that is, is ongoing, I've got an oversight of, of what is um, being undertaken with regard to Horse Cross. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to sort of preempt this afternoon's yeah. discussions, yeah. Um, but any work that is undertaken by internal audit will feed into that, uh, that decision making process. Timings of reports, I can't be too specific about at this point. Because um, I'm not entirely sure when um, wh uh, when the reports would be available to come to this committee. I think it would certainly be helpful to have that internal audit report before the council makes any final definitive decision, which it has not yet, on the merger of the the two alios. And that has to be a matter for the audit committee. And the audit Scotland report recently makes quite clear audit committees have got to have concern for alios as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for these comments, Councillor Donaldson. Um, Councillor McCall. Thank you, Convener. Um, thank you, Jackie. Uh, my question actually is a follow-up to uh, Councillor Drysdale's question on A1908, and it's bearing in mind some of the comments made by Councillor Donaldson regarding procurement. Is part of the internal audit in preparation for withdrawal from the European Union looking at the resilience of the supply chain in its entirety in the event of a no-deal Brexit, for example? Uh, yes, that is very much within scope. Thank you. And I have one follow-up question, if I may, and that's on the digital strategy. And while um, there is a drive towards digital inclusion for as many of our citizens as possible, there are uh, a cohort of our citizens who, for one reason or another, either through sensory or uh, learning disability or other types of impairment, may not necessarily be able to access the digital services that are being set up. So is there something in, within the internal audit profile to look at how we ensure uh, accessibility of council services for those citizens who cannot access the digital services for and one reason or another. I don't know if it may be appropriate to answer that question as part of the next paper or if you're happy to answer it just now. I'm okay. happy to answer it just okay, now. Okay, go for it just now. Uh, it's, certainly not, not, yeah. it's certainly not with, uh, not within the uh, internal audit plan for the current year, but it is within the audit universe, which is um, our, our basically a, a, a big review of, of what all options would be for internal audit to examine, uh, but it's not within uh, within the plan for the current year. Okay, if there are no further questions, can we agree to note this uh, internal audit update report? Thank you. Um, okay, so moving on to the final item on today's agenda, uh, and this is the substantive uh, internal audit report on digital strategy. Uh, and uh, if I can ask Jackie again to introduce that and um, introduce colleagues who may be able to answer questions. 
Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, as far as uh, colleagues who will be able to answer questions, we have uh, Lynn Harris here with us, who is uh, IT manager, and you'll see that she's uh, uh, she's um, noted as being um, uh, a key person who we've been dealing with throughout this audit. Um, uh, the, uh, the focus of this audit has been uh, documented within the two control objectives, which are to ensure that the Council is progressing with a digital strategy uh, in alignment with co uh, corporate strate strategic objectives, uh, um, and also to ensure that the Council's digital strategy takes into account current digital risks. Um, this is a very strong, a, a very positive report uh, that I'm able to give a uh, convener uh, with uh, a moderately strong and a strong strength of internal controls uh, in both areas. There are four actions which uh, the service is taking forward, uh, but overall I think that, you know, that, um, there's a good understanding of digital risks. Uh, they're, they're well articulated and documented and, uh, and are at the forefront of, of the management of the IT uh, service. So um, I was, uh, it was uh, very reassuring to uh, be able to bring this report towards uh, to audit committee. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm sure either between myself or um, with, with Lynn will be able to answer this, answer any questions. Thank you. It certainly is a, a strong report and uh, uh, I'm indebted to yourself and uh, to, uh, to Lynn for her input into that. If there are any questions, Councillor Williamson. Thank you, convener. It's on page 33. It's about the work with the, excuse me, <coughs> Uh, NHS Tay site. I was just wondering how close are we to, to working with NHS Tay site and how have, have we got both systems working alongside each other or talking to each other so that NHS staff can get access to PK C systems and vice versa? If I take that in two parts then, um, if we talk firstly about the relationships between PKC IT staff and the, our colleagues within NHS Tay site, they're very strong. We meet on a regular basis. That's that's the, um, the the business manager within our side, and and also across um, with with um, IT colleagues within health. So that relationships there at a strategic project level as well as an operational level. So in terms of sharing access to buildings, in terms of information governance, we have a, a, a very strong relationship with Donald. Obviously, um, our information governance manager, and he meets regularly with his opposite numbers in health, in fact, I think he met last week, or I think it was last week, to discuss how we can um, progress with memorandums of understanding and data sharing agreements to allow that to happen. That's the first, that's the first part. So that's, that's going quite well. Again, in Tayside, that also includes Angus and Dundee IT staff as well. So we met um, two weeks ago. So that, that, that takes place regularly. That looks at synergies and opportunities to learn from one another. In terms of system sharing, again, that's more complicated, but it is, it's, it's, it's perhaps not the one size fits all, but it's more of a modular approach to joining up systems. So you might not have one single system, but you'll, you're looking at one single approach for how occupational therapists work across health and social care partnerships. So that's, been, that's quite a mature, a mature stage now. So rather than looking at what we aren't able to do, it's, it's working within the constraints of, at the moment, of what we can do <coughs> moving forward so we've got a single view of the citizen or the patient. So, <coughs> so likes of uh, drug and alcohol, for example, where, where they're using two different systems, I would imagine, surely that's got a, an operational um, deficit if you've got you to transfer between both systems. So is what's been done to try and address that? I mean, at a national level, there's, there's lots of things going on in uh, the Scottish Government and, and, um, and, and Central Health. Um, th there's definitely a push towards that, and clearly where there's duplicate information <coughs> being, um, or information being input into more than one system, then there is increased uh, length of time to do that, obviously, and an increased risk of incorrect information going in. So it is what we're working towards but um, the IT bit comes at the end after all the governance is in place and all the clinicians have decided on, a, on, on the business processes that underpin the delivery of the services. Thank you, Councillor Donaldson. I'll be brief. I just want to follow up on Councillor Williamson's uh, point because I think it matters so much. Action point two, page 33 and 34. And I look at this, and it does state quite clearly in paragraph four, 
with the Health and Social Care Partnership. There is no detail of digital risks. It refers to the lack of a unified IT strategy. Therefore, spe specific digital risks have still to be defined. And that does concern me, although we have it as medium risk. Are you confident that we can rectify the situation by December of next year? Yes, I am. Um, just before we had the, uh, the, the meetings with, with the internal auditors, we had already uh, um, undergone uh, quite a significant programme of works, which goes back a couple of years, where we, um, that's in, me and my staff went in and met and discussed these, these areas following on from the, um, the, uh, the creation of the IGB. Um, the reason why it's taken a bit longer to get there is because they, they were more focused on, or were less focused on technology and more on information and, and, and other areas. What we've done since then is uh, a complete overview of the governance underpinning de delivery of the technology-enabled care projects and processes within, not only within um, the council sphere, but also the partnership, so moving across into community health as well. We've got a workshop, um, a, a, a large work workshop scheduled for the 6th of December this year, so that is all the senior managers within the partnership that includes ourselves as corporate IT as well as the uh, NHS IT staff and that's to identify the, the, the key priorities, a, a, a redo of the technology enabled care strategy and that's underpinned, that, that, that um, will allow for a focus on risk and controls and deliverables to take place and that will take place, that kicks off on the 6th of December. Okay, thank you, although I suspect this is something they're going to return to. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? No? Okay, thank you very much for your time. And can, I thank, uh, can we agree to note that report? Yeah. Okay, um, it's been a very full agenda this morning, uh, uh, but thank, uh, thanks to all members uh, and to uh, officers uh, and to our external auditors for, uh, for their contributions. Much appreciated. Thank you.